um, glad and humbled by another opportunity to speak in the gospel. Let us turn to the Holy Scriptures, to the book of Psalms, please. We're going to turn first to the heart of the Bible. To Psalm 22. Psalm 22, and just look quickly at the title, first of all. To the chief musician upon Ijaleth Shahar, a psalm of David. Now that phrase that is difficult to pronounce, and I don't know if I'm pronouncing it right, Ijaleth Shahar, could be also translated the hind of the morning. That beautiful young deer, the hind of of the morning. And that speaks to us a little bit about the person who is in focus in this psalm, a hind of the morning, that beautiful young deer that is helpless, that is defenseless, that could become a victim. And yet that hind of the morning sets in our mind, at least a beautiful picture of the person that is in this psalm. And yet what a contrast when we look at the experience that is described in this in these verses that we're going to look at right now, a very awful experience. Verse number one. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me? And from the words of my roaring. Verse six. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of man and despised of the people. All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip. They shake, they shake the head saying, he trusted on the Lord that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. But thou art he that took me out of the womb. Thou didst make me hope when I was upon my mother's breast. I was cast upon thee from the womb. Thou art my God from my mother's belly. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, for there is none to help. Many bulls having, have compassed me. Strong bulls of Bashan have beset me round. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue cleaveth to my jaws. And thou hast brought me into the dust of death. Verse 16, we find another group of people. In verse 12, we thought about those strong bulls of Bashan. Look at verse 16. For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. That's all we'll read of the psalm. But keep in mind the things that we have just read. They will be very pertinent to what we have to consider tonight. Let us turn now to the New Testament to see the fulfillment of this dark experience to the book of Mark and chapter 15. Mark 15. And verse 11, beginning at verse 11. But the chief priests, and we'll see that these are really the fulfillment of those that were described in Psalm 22 as the bulls of Bashan, those strong, those strong bulls that compassed him about. The chief priests moved the people that he should rather release Barabbas unto them. And Pilate answered and said again unto them, What will ye that I shall do unto him whom ye call the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, 
crucify him. Then Pilate said unto them, Why, why, what evil hath he done? And they cried out the more exceedingly, Crucify him. And so Pilate, willing to content the people, released Barabbas unto them and delivered Jesus when he had scourged him to be crucified. And the soldiers. And we'll notice how these are really fulfilling the second group that we're thinking about, the dogs that compass him about, that surrounded him and attacked him. And the soldiers led him away into the hall called Praetorium. And they called together the whole band. And they clothed him with purple and plaited a crown of thorns and put it about his head and began to salute him. Hail, King of the Jews. And they smote him on the head with a reed and did spit upon him. And bowing their knees, they worshipped him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple from him and put his own clothes on him and led him out to crucify him. Verse 24. And when they had crucified him, they parted his garments, casting lots upon them. Imagine that. That's the last verse that we were reading about. What every man should take. Jump down to verse 29. And they that passed by railed on him, wagging their heads and saying, Ah, thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself and come down from the cross. Likewise also the chief priests, mocking, said among themselves with the scribes, He saved others, himself he cannot save. Let Christ, the King of Israel, descend now from the cross that we may see and believe. And they that were crucified with him reviled him. And when the sixth hour was come, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, that's about 3 p.m. in the afternoon, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachnati, which is being interpreted, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Finally, jump down to verse 37. And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost. And the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to bottom to the bottom. And when the centurion, so that's the captain of all the soldiers there, which stood over against him, saw that he so cried out and gave up the ghost, he said, Truly, this man was the Son of God. One last verse, next chapter, chapter 16, verse 6. Looking now at three days on the third day, the first day of the week like today. And he saith unto them, Be not afraid. Ye seek Jesus of Nazareth, which was crucified. He is risen. He is not here. Behold the place where they laid him. May God bless the reading of his word. We began in Psalm 22, written a thousand years before Christ. It spoke about an awful experience, about someone that would go through something that none of us have experienced. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Is how the psalm begins. We didn't even read the whole psalm. But you notice what an awful experience is described in that psalm. And you find this person surrounded by two groups that come against him. And one of these groups is described as strong bulls. The bulls of Bashan that gaped upon him, that came at him with their mouths and surrounded this person. Later down, we find another group of people. Dogs have compassed me about. These savage animals, these wild animals that would come and surround to try and destroy, to try and to kill. They would come in to kill this person. We find some very specific predictions as well that he could say in that psalm, 
they pierced my hands and my feet. As well, we looked at the last verse that we were reading about how they would cast lots for their garments. They would gamble for this person's clothes as if he's not going to need them anymore. We're going to kill him. And so we can start gambling for the last, the last remaining material goods that, the, that this person has. All this was written a thousand years before Christ. And yet we just read the experience of the cross when the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. And there is nothing else that that psalm could ever be describing but the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. We don't need proofs to know that this is the word of God since it comes from God. But if you, wanted for, if you wanted to look for confirmations, that is one enormous confirmation that this is the word of God. Only God could speak about something that would happen a thousand years from now. And that's exactly what he did in Psalm 22. And so Christ came, the hind of the morning, taking the place of a victim, taking the place of a helpless creature that cannot defend itself. And yet the Lord of glory willingly took that spot. That was the tremendous contrast. That is part of the mystery of the cross. That the one who had displayed his power throughout his lifetime, walking on water, feeding multitudes, thousands of people out of just a few loaves and fishes, healing those that were blind, those that couldn't hear, those who had never walked, he had just demonstrated clearly his power. Not only that, but he also had angels at his command. He said that he could pray to his father and he would not hesitate to send 12 legions of angels to come to his rescue. You know how powerful angels are. There was an account in history way back when an Assyrian king, king came up against Jerusalem and this king had a tremendous army, the most powerful army at that time. And it was an army of hundreds of thousands. And you know how many angels it took to defeat that army? One angel. One angel came during the night, sent by God, and defeated the, that great army, the greatest army on earth at that time. In one night, the Lord Jesus had thousands of angels at his command. He could have avoided the, the cross if that was his will, but it wasn't. My will is to do the will of him who sent me. That's the will of the Father. The Lord Jesus Christ set his face steadfastly to go to Jerusalem. He didn't avoid it. He, also, he didn't just show that he had all power, so he could have defended himself if he so wanted. But he also demonstrated throughout the things that he said and the experiences that he lived that he knew all things. Many times in the gospel it is recorded, Jesus knowing. Knowing what was in their heart, as in he could know our thoughts. Knowing what was going to happen, etc. The Lord Jesus Christ, he knew all things. Knowing beforehand that some harm is going to come to you, you would naturally avoid it. You would turn away. And yet the Lord Jesus Christ willingly set his face steadfastly to go to Jerusalem to experience this very awful thing of crucifixion. Why? Why did he do that? Even the very earthly judge that was set before him, Pilate, who had the power to deliver him or to condemn him, even he said, I find no wrong in him. Three times over in the book of John, he says I that he had found nothing wrong with him there is nothing amiss with him there is no sin there is no crime this man is not uh, worthy to be put to death so how did the lord jesus go to this place well we find these two groups that had come against him the bulls of bashan and these dogs and we'll see as we look at these two groups we actually see all of mankind represented because when you look at the cross, it was really mankind that crucified the Son of God. 
And we are all collectively guilty of this, crucifying the one who God had sent. Think first of all of the bulls of Bashan. And those speak to us of the religious world. We see them represented in those chief priests and in the scribes and in the Pharisees, the religious leaders of that time. And we see that the world of religion didn't really want anything to do with the Lord Jesus Christ. They wanted to have him crucified. Why was that? Well, one of the reasons is this, that the Lord Jesus Christ was preaching salvation by grace. That means that salvation is not something that you can merit. It's not something that you can earn. You cannot earn your way into heaven by your good works. You cannot pay enough to get into heaven. The only way you could ever get into heaven is by receiving something freely from God, which is salvation. Salvation is a gift, something that is given. In John 3.16, when the Lord Jesus was speaking, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth on him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So is that whosoever believeth plus do it, that plus does a lot of good works or plus get, does a lot of charity or plus does a lot of religion? No. Whosoever believeth on him alone, on Christ alone and nothing else shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Religion does not like that. The religion of this world does not like that. People like to feel self-sufficient. People like to feel like they earn something. And so that's why there's so many religions in this world. They all, do, they all do basically the same things. Give me a set of rules and I'm going to try to adhere to them as much as, as possible. And then I might be okay after this life, but at least I'm going to try my best. I'm, gonna to, I'm going to earn it as much as I can. That is men's religion. And that stood completely in contrast to what the Lord Jesus Christ was preaching. And so they wanted him gone. What else does, what else stands in contrast with Christ? The Lord Jesus Christ was exclusive. Now on one side, I want to say that he is very inclusive because the salvation that he brings is for the whole world. I just quoted John 3.16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Salvation goes out to the whole world. Anyone who comes to Christ can be saved. But he is very exclusive in this sense. He said, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Men's religions doesn't like that. They don't like that. People like to think that there's many ways to God. That you can just go out and explore and you somehow, everyone will eventually find their way to God. Somehow, every, every way leads to, just like we have that expression, every way leads to Rome. People like to apply that spiritually and they think that every way leads to God. It is not true. The Lord Jesus Christ very clearly said, I am the way. There's no two ways. There's no three ways. There is no other way. If you ever want to be in heaven, if you ever want to, to be right with God and have eternal life, there is only one way, and it is through the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And finally, why did they not like Christ? Not just because he was preaching a salvation that is freely given from God, something that we can't earn. Not only was he very exclusive in that he said, I am the way, but also he was God in the flesh. John chapter one tells us, chapter one tells us, in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. Verse 14 of that chapter tells us that, God, that, that the word was made flesh. Very clearly, the word is God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and he was made flesh. He became flesh. When he was born in Bethlehem 2,000 years ago, he, the Lord Jesus, is God in the flesh. 
This is a God who has come down into this world. This is a God who has come down and seen us face to face. It is a God who has chosen to reveal himself very clearly and plainly. But mankind like to be away from God. That's why we like to muddle things and make things kind of cloudy and hard to see. And so you, you look in Eastern religions and you see that there's millions of gods. And you look in even religions where people believe in only one God, but it's a God who is far away, who cannot be known. But that is not the true living God. The true living God came into this world. The Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ was his name. And he unfolded unto us all that God is. And now it's not some fuzzy thing to know who God is. You can really see who God is in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so these three things really made the religious world not like him. And they wanted Christ crucified. But that wasn't all. We find that the dogs, those savage animals, also compassed about and wanted a piece of this person. And they wanted to destroy and to kill him. And this group now represents the rest of the world, the secular world, if you will. And that has a lot more to do with Vancouver today. This group was represented by those soldiers, those Roman soldiers, the representatives of the global empire at that time. They were representatives of Rome. And those cruel soldiers came and they mocked the Lord Jesus Christ. And they poked fun at him. They were just looking for some entertainment. They were looking for some pleasure. And they went and they beat him and they scourged him. And they put on him a, a little robe and they pretended like he was a king. And they eventually were the ones who physically drove those nails through his hands and through his feet and crucified the very son of God. Why had they become soldiers? Many became soldiers at that time, looking for power, looking for fame. They wanted to grow themselves up. They wanted to be seen by others. And isn't that what is so popular today, especially with social media? Post a selfie, post something about yourself, get seen, get a bunch of likes, get yourself followers. And it's all about me, me, me. Not only that, but these soldiers were looking for wealth. A successful soldier could climb the ranks and become very, very wealthy. And that's what people chase after today, right? They want more and more money. Something that you can't take with you into the next life. Something that stays behind. And so money is fleeting. Money is only here for a little bit and then passing away. And yet these soldiers representing our world today were chasing after wealth. But here was one who didn't have much wealth. So what, why would they be attracted to him? This person couldn't bring me much wealth. And so they wanted to crucify him. And finally, these soldiers were just looking for some pleasure. They were just looking for some entertainment. And that is what this world looks after as well, right? Just some little flashy thing, just some quick video, just some quick entertainment. And I'll just waste my life and I'll be okay. Not so. And so which one of these two camps would you find yourself in? Are you part of that religious world who would want to get rid of Christ? Or are you part of that secular world who would, who would want to get rid of Christ because he is condemning to both? In his holy, righteous person, he is condemning to the righteous, to, to the self-righteous world. He's condemning to the religious world who is trying to earn their way into heaven by their own works. And he is condemning to the secular world who is trying to only pay attention to this world. Like if only this life matters, they wanted to crucify him. If you are not saved, you are on one of those two camps. So which one are you tonight? You don't need to stay there any longer because the whole amazing thing of the cross is that the Lord Jesus Christ was there dying for the very ones who were crucifying him. He went to the cross to save us from our sin. He, came, he went to the cross to take the place of the sinner and all the judgment and wrath of God that we all deserved because of our own personal sins. 
The Lord Jesus Christ paid for it on the cross. One of the things that they mocked him with, they had no idea how true it was. They said he saved others. He saved others. I don't know exactly what they meant by that. Maybe they had seen the miracles that he did and how he had healed people. Maybe it goes further and they had heard of the people of whom the Lord Jesus had forgiven all of their sins. And so they said he saved others. They didn't know how true that was. Through what the Lord Jesus Christ did that day on the cross. Through his crucifixion, through his death, burial, and resurrection. He is willing and able to save all of humanity. And he could save you tonight. The Lord Jesus himself died on the cross. The holy righteous son of God. Paid the infinite price to make salvation available to the whole world. He paid it all. He did everything that had to be done to bring a sinner back to himself. To open the gates of heaven for a sinner like you and like me. So all that is left for you to do is to trust in him. He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. So what do you have tonight? Do you have religion? Do you have wealth, fame? Do you have this world's entertainment? Or do you want something better? You can have salvation. You can have the forgiveness of all of your sins. If you trust in the Savior of the world, he, he can become your own personal Savior, even tonight. May you do so. May God bless his word. Turn with me, please, to Matthew's Gospel. We're going to read from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1. <clears throat> Beginning of the New Testament, for any who are unfamiliar with the Bible, it's the first book of the New Testament. It's about... Uh, Three quarters of the way through the scriptures. We're going to read and the Gospel of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all begin with the account of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. We're going to read here in chapter 1 of Matthew's Gospel from verse uh, 20. <clears throat> and while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, that's who these words were being spoken to, Thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. And verse 21 says this, And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Come down to the last verse of the chapter here. And the last verse ends, it says, And she brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Now come over to Luke's Gospel. That's two books over, Matthew, Mark, and then Luke. Luke's Gospel, chapter 2. Hmm. <clears throat> And Luke's Gospel, chapter 2 here, and um, verse 7. It's Luke's version of the same event. And he says, And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling clothes, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. That will do for our reading of Scripture this evening together. <clears throat> I want to speak tonight, the subject of my message is to dwell upon the day that Jesus was born, the day that Jesus was born. <clears throat> you know, when a son is born, 
at any time. There's much rejoicing. And often everyone's on the phone or the internet and they, they want to announce, announce the news, such as the, a time of happiness, of great joy when a son is born and uh, everyone's excited. Well, at the birth of Jesus, the son of God, at his birth, his, uh, God shared the news of his birth in amazing ways that the scriptures have recorded for us uh, to a variety of people. Um, Hebrews actually tells us, in the, uh, later on in the New Testament, it actually tells us that it was declared unto the angels. There was a, there was a declaration of the angels that said unto which of them has he at any time called them, this day have I begotten thee. And so God shared the news with angels. And, uh, and so that declaration to all creation, which includes the angels, would be that he's a son before all. That's the point of Hebrews. He's a son above all, before all. Um, and then uh, the news of the birth of Jesus was shared with shepherds, just humble men, not uh, rich men by any means, or great men in the world, but shepherds. And they received this message unto you is born this day in the city of David, a savior, which is Christ the Lord. And so when God revealed the message of the birth of Jesus to shepherds, it was that he was a savior to all. Isn't that tremendous? A savior to all. What a gift from God. And then we're told that uh, God not only shared the news with shepherds, but far off in the eastern lands from Jerusalem, there were men who had been uh, reading probably reading the Bible, uh, and they had been looking for uh, an understanding to understand more about the promised Son of God who was coming. And we're told that they saw his star in the east, and they came. And, uh, and so they said, when they came, where is he that is born king of the Jews? And so the birth of Jesus was announced to wise men, educated men, from shepherds to wise men, the scholars of the university of the day and what they understood as God revealed to them was that, the, that Jesus was a sovereign, a king above all. Isn't that tremendous? And then finally, uh, we have read here tonight of the birth of Jesus in these verses where it said uh, that she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the guest chamber. That's really the word. That's not a motel, it's not a hotel. And I'll explain a bit, bit more about this. But the point is, he was born into a house of ordinary people. And so from the angels to the shepherds to wise men and then just to people, the message of God was declared so clearly. People in a household that night. And that's what I'm going to spend a little bit more time on thinking just about ordinary people who heard the message of the birth of Jesus just in their home. And I want you to think as we, th as we look at this together, I want you to think about this message of God and, his, and the birth of his son and all that it means that's brought to you. Because God brought the message just to ordinary people like you and me. And, and, uh, and they heard this, the birth of Jesus, who shall save, who shall, his name is Jesus, because he shall save his people from their sins. <clears throat> we read there when um, the, the, the message came before his birth from heaven to Joseph, that when the son would be born, his name shall be called Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And, you know, only he can save his people. Only he can save. And that's the message I want you to remember tonight. We've heard about other gods. We people talk about gods. They talk about Allah, Muhammad, Buddha, Krishna, science, or anything else. You know, none of those things can save a person from their sins. What we're bringing to you tonight is a message from heaven, from God. In fact, it's more than a message because a man came. Um, the, the actual son of God came and, and took upon himself a body like you and I so that he could become our savior and save us from our sins. Just a picture of the scene here. Uh, as I said, 
Um, we read here in our King James Version here, and often at Christmas time, you know, you, you, you can see the little diagrams and images that people have, um, uh, you know, the picture of, of the, the, the baby and the parents out in the stables, so to speak. But actually, what the scriptures tells us here, the word is that he was born into, a, there was no room for him in the guest chamber. Now, in those days, they didn't have a house didn't have apartments, they didn't have a grand big house like we have with four levels, but the typical home of the day was a two level house. Um, probably no, nothing fancy, but on the, on the main level on the ground floor would be where everyone lived. The kitchen, the dining room, the living room, and the corners where the beds were set up, and this was where people lived. Uh, and most houses maybe were like that. And then some houses would have an upper level and it was where what was called the guest chamber would be. Often they tell us in that, in that, in that era, the guest chamber was a room that was, no, there were no walls internal. It was just an open space. You went upstairs and there was this big open space. It was the guest chamber, same guest chamber, type of guest chamber that is spoken of where they remembered the Lord when he, when he uh, instituted the Lord's Supper. But in any case, what was happening, the scriptures tells us there was a big event happening in the land of Israel, and everyone who was distant, who had gone away to live in, 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 in Africa and Egypt and all these places around the world, people who were Jews, they were called to come back to Israel because Caesar wanted to tax his people. And so they had to come back to that town that they were born in. And, uh, and so there was lots of people in Bethlehem this day. And, uh, and, and so obviously this particular family we're not even told their name the name of the people who owned this house who had this gas chamber that's how ordinary they were but these people um they they had welcomed other guests no doubt and there was the guest chamber was full and there was no room for mary and joseph and of course no room in the guest chamber when the lord jesus was born so i want you to picture this scene and you think of the 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 the, the people downstairs he was born there, uh, and and uh, um, and uh, you know at night they would bring the animals inside because it was cold. Often did that, and so when he when he was born in the guest in, in uh, wrapped in swaddling clothes and laid in a manger, this is a scene where he was brought into a people's ordinary lives. I want you to think about that. It says here that uh, the message of of his name would be that he shall save his people from their sins. I want to think about that. These people in that house, these people have heard the birth of the Lord Jesus. I just, I just picture them thinking of this baby, this message, this messenger from God, the Son of God, he shall save us from our sins. I wonder if they'd ever thought about that before. Save us from our sins. He's coming to save us from our sins. It's come to save us from our sins. I want you to think about that. Um, they, there they were. He was right there in their house, in their ordinary lives. You know, often we don't think uh, about our sin that much, do we, as people? We, um, we like to kind of uh, avoid those topics. And, um, you know, we don't... Uh, um, we think most of the time we're thinking about, uh, you know... Um, getting ready for work or school tomorrow, thinking about what we're going to do when we get home, maybe what we're going to cook for dinner or when to do the washing or when to get something, when to go out and do something fun, something interesting, or when we can just uh, get away from everything and sit in a corner and have some rest or play some games, have some fun, or worrying about maybe older, when you, people get older, worry about their money and worry about lots of things. People think about lots of things. But if God is challenging you tonight. What are you thinking about? Even in this meeting, the message of Jesus when he came, when he was born, was that he shall save his people from their sins. And so people in this house are thinking about their sins. You know, um, that day that Jesus was born, that home was disturbed. It was disrupted. You know, this message came to a busy home, no doubt. It was a busy time. The guest chamber is full. Can you imagine? Everyone's so busy running around. And yet, uh, to that busy home came a message. Stop. Someone has been born. He's come to save from sin, from your sin. 
And so a busy home, it was a bulging home, hardly any room. Often our lives seem like this, don't they? We don't have any room for Jesus, no room to think about these things. And we come and maybe come to a gospel meeting and, and uh, we, we, we go and we just, our lives are so busy and we don't have any room and God has a message for busy people like, that, like us who says, stop, I come. My son has come to save his people from their sins. It was a burdened home. We know that because they had, it was from their sins. That's why he comes to save. It's not a, if, if, he, if, a, if a person doesn't have a burden and doesn't feel that burden, then why would they need a savior? But he's come to save his people from their sins. And so what a wonder, what a joyful wonder it was the day that Jesus was born. And he came to save his people from their sins. You know, it's very personal, this message. It's not, he, the message isn't just that he came to save from sin. That sounds very nice, doesn't it? But it sounds very much, it's for someone else. But the message was he shall save their, his people from their sin. My friend, I want you to think about your sin. That's what God wants you to think about tonight if you're not saved. That's why he came. We've got a problem inside and we need the Savior. If we don't, you know, uh, there's an eternity of suffering and sorrow for the soul who dies without Christ and goes into the lake of fire forever and forever, tormented and judged in darkness and distance from God. What a tragedy. What a tragedy. The Lord Jesus was willing to suffer on the cross. He was willing to, he, to go through agonies that we could never imagine. He was willing to do that, to save you from your sin. That's the only way he could save you from your sin. And so he came to do that. And then um, this message he shall, he, he shall be called Jesus, or he shall save his people from their sins. We've talked about their sins. Now I want to speak about how that he shall save. You know, he came to save, but why did he, came, why did he come to save? He didn't just come to fix us up. You know, some folks feel like maybe, you know, I'm a little bit deficient. I'm a, I'm a sinner and I'm a little bit short of what I should be. Uh, and so he's just come to fill up my deficiency, make me a little bit more acceptable. And they feel like they can do with 80% uh, me and 20% of Jesus. Uh, and, and, and that's kind of how the natural mind, mind thinks. We think we're not so bad as what God says. We think that we're better than what God says. We think he's not quite as good as what he says. And so we kind of pass it off in our minds and we don't take it that seriously but my friend he shall save he came he's the savior he's the only savior for sinners and and the and the even just in his name that god announced he shall save he came to save us because we can't be fixed up we're not fixable have you realized that what the bible teaches is that as humans as souls as eternal souls, we are not able to just be fixed and tweaked and improved and so that then we can be good enough to go to heaven. We are sinners and sin has ruined us. And it has ruined every person who has been born into this world. We are not able to be in heaven. We are incapable and unable to be fixed. <clears throat> what Jesus does He's come to save us from our sins, not to fix us up, not to improve us just enough so that he can get us to heaven, but to save us. A person who's perishing needs to be saved. And my dear friend, if you haven't trusted him yet, then you're perishing and you need to be saved. You're in great danger and you require rescuing. <clears throat> How does he save? Well, people in this household that we're thinking of, these ordinary people, they, were, they would have been Jews, and they would have understand when a person sins, what was required was that they were to take a sacrifice in their day. They took a sacrifice, a little lamb or something, and they would take it up to the temple, and they would uh, offer it 
and they would realize that this animal is dying because God's righteous requirement says that a sin does require death. It's, that's the punishment of sin. Isn't that awful? The punishment of sin, and yet the punishment of sin is upon us all until we're saved. And so they knew that that animal, that sacrifice would die in their stead. And so when they heard the news that Jesus has come because he's, he and he will save his people from their sins, they understood, surely they understood that that's how he saves. He doesn't fix people up. But the, but the wages of sin is death. We deserve to die. And the only way he can save us is to bear that punishment for us in, his, in our stead upon the cross of Calvary. And so that's why he went to the cross. And so there he died. And, uh, and so he, um, he bore that penalty. He paid the penalty. And the penalty was meted out upon him, laid upon him. And so that's how a person now is free. A person who trusts in the Savior is saved because their sins have been dealt with. And now they're a new creation in Christ. You see, you need, you need the Savior. You need Jesus who shall, who shall save his people from their sins. Now, there's just one little piece, one third little piece left in this saying that we've been looking at together that was announced by God on the occasion of the birth of Jesus. He shall save, we've considered that, from their sins, we've considered that. But this little piece in the middle, his people, his people. He shall save his people from their sins. How do I become one of his people? Well, we've been hearing it tonight already. By believing in the Lord Jesus Christ and will be saved. You know, um, the, the uh, Acts chapter 10, uh, it says, uh, To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, his name Jesus, through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission cleansing, wiping clean of sin. And so this is the message. That's how we can become one of his people. Every person who has trusted in the Savior, believed in him for salvation and trusted in him, turning away from their sin, every, every single one has been saved and is saved for eternity. He shall save his people from their sin. So God announced his name to many people. Um, we've seen the responses of the wise men and the shepherds and the people who responded properly and believed the word and trusted in the Savior. But sadly, there were others who responded with indifference. Uh, the Bible tells us about those people to, to whom Christ meant nothing. And, uh, you know, Herod, he, uh, he, he, uh, he, he asked about the, where's Jesus being born. He's heard some news about the birth of this Jesus. Then he asked the chief priests, and they said, well, we, we don't really know, but we'll go look it up. And he meant nothing to them. And so uh, they didn't really care. How tragic that those people who actually ought to have known their Bible the best in the land of Israel were the least who knew anything about him. And it's sad, isn't it? And if you've been coming to gospel meeting for a long time or even a short time, you know, uh, it's a tragic thing to have known and heard the message but never actually believed it and to miss out for eternity from the salvation that we've been speaking about. So which one are you in this story? This message came to ordinary people that we've been thinking about tonight, a message to them, to us, right where you are today, right to your house, right to your life. God has a message. His name is Jesus, because he shall save his people from their sin. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank thee for such a clear message, even in the name of Jesus, a name that may be upon many lips tonight in this world, in this city around us. But yet, our Father, how few really understand its value. Our Father, we thank thee for the scriptures that we've read tonight that have um, laid uh, completely clear for us that it's the meaning of his name and the meaning and the purpose of his coming was that he shall save his people from their sins. Our Father, we thank thee for the cross of Calvary. We thank thee that there he paid the price in full. And so, Father, we just pray 
for any who are, have heard the gospel tonight that have not yet trusted him as their savior. Our Father, we pray that they would be drawn to him to realize that he is our only hope. He is our only savior. And our Father, through this name, through this man, has preached unto us forgiveness of sins. What a glorious future. What a glorious name our Lord Jesus has. Our Father, we pray that each one in our gathering this evening would come to know him as their savior. Our Father, watch over us as we part. We commend ourselves to thee. We thank thee for this evening once more in his worthy and precious name. Amen. <clears throat> Oh. <clears throat>